for our mom's night out online and as always i am so amazingly um grateful to have this time with you and to be here together my name is susan c and tonight we are going to be talking about 10 ways that i have found 10 tips that i have found to becoming a better listener for us to be able, as moms, to be able to connect with our kids, to be able to create a connection where they feel heard by us. Last month, we talked about communication, where we talked about the things that we say to them and when we them and how we choose to say them. But this month, I feel like our topic is even more important because talking has got to be one of the worst forms of communication that is available. And what do I mean by that? Think about how many times you have said something and think about how many times people have actually heard what it is you said. Think about how many times you try to communicate a message and you have done your utmost and your best to be clear, to be simplistic, to be on top of things, to be exact. And still you find yourself misunderstood, directions not followed, people creating their own meaning of what it is that you said and things still not happening in the way that you tried your best to get done. Can you guys relate to that? So I say that talking has got to be one of the worst forms of communication because it just is so, there's so much that's a part of communication and we try to rely so heavily on the kids and tell our kids and tell our kids but if we realize that I have a statistic here, actually, and if you see me look down, it's because I've got all my notes. And usually you guys don't see me. But it says between 25 and 50% of what we hear, we don't remember. That means on the low side, we've got, you know, what is that, the high side, 75% of what's said someone didn't even hear. And then on the other end, we're looking at 50% of what we say they actually hear. So you can imagine, out of all the things you may try to tell your kids in a day, all of the things you want to communicate to them, the messages you want to send to them, that there's between 50 and 75% of what you said they will not even remember. That makes talking really hard. But for those of you who don't know who I am, and it will likely be those, a lot of those watching the recording, my name is Susan C, and I want to introduce myself because I am a mentor for moms. I have a heart and a passion for seeing moms be the intentional that I believe they were designed to be. I believe it's no accident the children that they were given. I believe that their families are precious. I believe that all that they're trying to do can be a distraction from sometimes from what is most important in their lives. And I want to be that voice who comes in and who reminds them that they are fully capable, fully able to do all that is needed to love their children wholly and completely and to serve their families in a way that causes their children to rise up and call them blessed. And I am honored to have that position because I understand that in this world today to be the parent and the mother that so many of us desire to be, there's a lot of challenges. And it's illustrated so beautifully in this image because as you overcome one challenge, you face yet another. And as you overcome that challenge, you face yet another. And it can be wearying and daunting if you don't have a mentor to come beside you, if you don't build a sisterhood and a team and a friendship and connection with other women that will be with you to go through this journey with you. Now, if you see me bouncing up and down, it's because I'm still sitting on my exercise ball from last month. And I just realized that as I went to move and I started bouncing. So if you see me bouncing, that's what's happening. If you ever feel the need to desire to reach out to me, feel free. Here's my website. It's susanc.com. I'm on Facebook. You can reach out to me there. And as a matter of fact, it's my intent through Facebook to reach out to you. I, if you're on Facebook, I have a desire in my heart to interrupt your news feed with things that are noteworthy, things that are encouraging, things that cause you to think, and things that are worth sharing with your friends. So if we are not yet connected on Facebook, I would feel so honored if you would go over to my page, like the page, and if you see things that come through that feed 
that touch your heart, that cause you to think, make you smile, I ask that you like them because that communicates to Facebook that you want to see more of them. If you don't like them, Facebook says you don't want to see them and you won't see that no matter if you've liked the page or not. That's just how Facebook works. So do be aware of that, that if you like those things, if they are noteworthy enough for you to pause, think, smile, think differently, click like. If you do not feel that way, do not click like. And I will take that as a vote of these are the things that, that my moms want to hear. And these are the things that help my moms to be better and to grow. And those things that don't get that attention, I will take note and, po and post less of those things. So here we go. We're going to jump in tonight with 10 ways to help you be a better listener. But first, I always like to get you guys warmed up in that chat box because I want this to be a dialogue between us. We're not all sitting in the room. I don't get to look into all of your eyes and see your faces as much as I would love to. But I love this venue because you get to be at home in the midst of those people that you love so much. And you still get to have my voice come to you it's scratchy and awkward as it is this month but i'd love for you to name for me a few reasons to become a better listener so could someone share with me what would be some reasons why we would want to become a better listener i see some typing going on i don't see any answers just yet that's okay. Never mind waiting. Hmm. So listening is a gift. Yes, I agree. Anyone else have an answer? What why would we want to become a better listener? What would be the reasons for that? Oh, to help, yes, to help another person to feel valued. Absolutely. I don't see anyone else typing, so I'm gonna guess that the others are not probably not able to reach it. Some people use this time to eat dinner and listen, so their hands aren't free, and that's great. So we could also say that this helps someone being a good listener, helps you to build relationship. It helps communicate love. It helps communicate value. As, as Jeanette has said, you cause the person to feel valued. It is a way for you to build connection with another person. All of those are great reasons. And I want to share with you that tonight, a lot of what I'm going to share with you is from a workshop that I attended on becoming a better listener. There's so many trainings and um, opportunities that I uh, avail myself of because I want to infuse myself with tools that I think can be a benefit to moms that I serve. It's not unheard of me, uh, uh, unheard of for me to attend regularly trainings workshops, seminars. Um, I just got back from a leadership training for a full week in San Francisco, which was outstanding and out of this world. And I do that because I want to have tools and resources to share with you all. It is important to me. And a lot of what I'm going to share tonight actually came from a gentleman named Michael Krent. And he's here in Austin and he put on a workshop about becoming a better listener. And I put this up there because I wanted you to check out his website. He has an entire business where he goes out and he interviews um, World War II veterans and a lot of our aged in um, our community to get their stories. And he chronicles them on video and he creates video, um, a documentary sort of sorts for their family members to have oral stories of their family history and key family members of theirs and their history and stories and experiences so that they can be shared with future generations via video. Isn't that outstanding? I just love that. And so because he's dealing with a lot of the aged, he has become a master at being a listener and what it takes to really draw out people's stories, what it takes for people to open up on stories that they've never shared with anyone. Or what does it take to get someone who's resistant to speaking about themselves? Maybe they're very, very humble or very cautious. How do you get them to open up? And he created an entire workshop of teaching how to become a better listener. 
And I wanted to just grab those tools. I've got pages and notes here to share them with you because I thought that you would find them to be valuable. So let's get started with number one. Number one in being a better listener is preparing to listen. Right? How many times can we be found in um, a busy portion of our day when suddenly our children want to talk, right? Or maybe it's a time when we're not fully conscious. You know, it's early in the morning. We're still half asleep. And we get people who come in the room and they want to tell us about their dreams or what it was like last night or what happened. And we're still kind of groggy and half awake. So what about if we actually prepare ourselves to listen? Maybe there's some loud noises in the house and we need to turn those down or turn them off. Maybe there's a distraction of a TV or the distraction of music or noise. Or maybe, like I said, we're groggy and we're sleepy. We need to prepare ourselves to listen. And we can say, okay, hold on. You know, give me a minute. I know for me, I might say, let me put some pillows behind my back and actually sit up. Let me not pretend that I'm listening to you when really my eyes are half closed or fully closed. And I'm trying to assure you I'm listening. I'm not listening. I'm still sleepy. And uh, so preparing ourselves to listen, giving ourselves that um, permission to turn everything else off and really honor the person who's talking to us at that time, be it one of our children, be it our spouse, be it a friend, really taking that moment to prepare to listen. The next thing, number two, is going to be take a deep breath. And I actually want you guys to do that right now. I would love for you to just take a moment and take a deep breath in and release. I got to tell you, I've done that a lot in this past week because it's been really a part of the leadership training that I was in. Because they talk to us about how um, unconsciously when we're thinking about something or when we're troubled by something, or when we're processing, processing, okay, I'm going to try, processing, <laughs> processing something, we are, we have a tendency to stop breathing deeply. We start breathing really shallow, and we're not breathing. We're not giving our brains the oxygen to function and do well, and we're cutting off our um, emotions, and we don't communicate as well, and how important it is for us to take a deep breath. So I really want us, as we become better listeners, to learn to take a deep breath and then choose. Notice I said choose to be fully present. Attempting to multitask, attempting to do multiple things at the same time as we call ourselves listening is actually a choice. And it's a choice that can create or communicate things other than what we really want. It can create a situation where people feel that we're communicating, they're not valuable, what they have to say is not that important, that they're not interested in, that we're not interested in connecting with them. But if we would take a deep breath and then choose to be fully present in that moment, I think it sets the tone for our conversation that it's all different. It's a tone that communicates. I'm with you right now. What you have to say is important to me. No matter how brief it is or how long it is, I want to hear it and take it in. And everything else that I'm doing can wait as I give you my full attention. How many of us would value that if the people that we love and care about would do that for us? If they would take a deep breath and choose to be fully present with us when we're talking. Can you imagine what that would feel like? And just imagine being able to create that for your children. Yes, Jeanette, deep breath is also less painful than biting your tongue. Yes, it absolutely is. And it I have found it to diffuse my anger and keep me from going into sarcasm so often because that deep breath actually caused me to hesitate and being so quick to speak, so quick at the tongue, that I end up lashing out. I end up saying things that I go, oh, I didn't really mean that. I try to laugh it off as if they didn't already hear it or already feel the pain of those words. So absolutely. 
I have a little statement here that says we are always taking in information, but not always actively listening. So we can't not be taking in information. Even when we're sleeping, we're being influenced by the noises that are around us. That's why I really caution moms about going to sleep with the TV on and the things that they're hearing, even while they're asleep, their subconscious is taking those things in. And if you're like me and you have sensitivity in that area, what I'm listening to when I'm sleeping will actually affect the dreams that I have. And I can have some pretty vivid and horrific dreams if I have not been mindful that I went to sleep before my husband and he decides to watch one of his bang, bang, shoot him up, you know, toss people from buildings kind of a movie. Um, that I end up having dreams where people have fallen. And, I mean, it's just crazy. I wake up and I go, dang it, I went to sleep again with you with one of those movies on. But it's very real. So imagine if you go to sleep with that news on, or you go to sleep with movies, or you go to sleep with anything that has um, messages that are not pure, that are not true, that are not encouraging, that are not building you up. Your subconscious is processing all those things, but even more so throughout the day. Sometimes people like to leave the news on in the background during the day. Maybe the TV is on or talk radio is on and there's this constant conversation going on. Your mind is taking in all of that information, even if you're not actively listening. But what I'm really proposing that we learn to do is to be better active listeners with our children, with our families, with the people we love. But we choose in to those conversations. All right, number three. Okay, this is going to be one that I'm desperately working on. And that is don't interrupt. Oh, my gracious. How many times do my children come to me? And I feel like I already know what they're about to say. And I can see it on your face. I can see the request coming for stuff I've already said no to. I can I can already know what you're going to tell me. Like, I just do, 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 do. Cut it off, cut it off, cut it off, cut it off. Right? And yes, Tracy, we can do that with our husbands as well. Yes. I know my husband can start to share something about his day. And it so reminds me of something that happened in my day. And boom, I'm off of my story. And after I've been talking for a while, I go, uh-oh, I think you were actually trying to tell me something. I'm so sorry. And if I don't catch it quick enough, sometimes he will actually forget whatever it was he was trying to say. And I miss that moment. Anybody else's husband like that? But like, if you miss the moment, it's like the moment is gone. Like, you won't hear that story until weeks later when he's talking to a friend or talking to a family member. And he starts telling him about what happened in his life and his day. And then you're like, wait, what? I never, how come you never told me that? Well, it's likely for me, one of those times when I cut off his whole share because I got excited about my share and I missed my moment. But it can equally be the same with my children that they start to tell me something that I'm maybe already heard from another child or I can anticipate what they're trying to say, excuse me. <clears throat> and I end up interrupting them. And once again, what does that communicate to them? that what they have to say is not that important, that um, I don't value what they have to say, that I have a better way of telling their very own stories, all of those messages, none of which I want to communicate. Yes. Yes, Jeanette, that like the whole interruption thing could be another opportunity to do what, ladies? Take a deep breath. Oh, that's so good, Susan. Never miss a good opportunity to remain silent. Yes. All right, ladies, we're going to jump on in here to number four. Keep your comments and your advice to a minimum. Come on. I think we already know how we feel. Okay, let me speak for me again. When I share something with my husband and he launches into solution mode, you know, do, 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 I have a solution. Susan, this is what you should do. And you should do it like this. And this is what I think. Da, 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 da. And I just shut down. You know, I almost go into like a two-year-old mode where I'm like, I didn't come to you for that advice. I didn't come for you to tell me what I need to do. I was sharing my story here, dude, right? But how much do our kids maybe feel that way? When we come to them, they sharing with us and we start in with our comments. Oh, you're having problems with that little girl at the playground? You know, I never really liked that little girl. Hold on, time out. Like, yeah, our kids weren't asking us for that. 
They were sharing their issue and their story. Oh, how, well, I wouldn't let any kid do that. That's that's just not okay. And we can, you know what you should do. You should really handle it. This is how you should handle it. The next time they come in there and we launch into a whole lesson, I'm really speaking for me. If it fits you, the great thing is I can't hear you anyway. So if you're saying yes to the computer, uh, I can't hear you. So we don't know that it's also you. We just think this is Susan has major issues and she's sharing them. But I launch into a whole lesson about it, man. And if I get really in the groove, then I'll throw a scripture in there and I'll get to preaching. And I have long since left their share, right? They are no longer sharing. This has become my platform, my soapbox. I'm sharing and I will label it as being a good mom because I help my kids know how to handle those situations. Now, it is not as if they don't need that from time to time, but we can make such a habit out of it that they don't want to share with us anymore. And that's really what I'm reaching for is those moments when we just need to be a better listener. Oh, I love that description, Jeanette. We become unsafe for them. We're no longer a safe zone for them to come and pour their burdens out, right? We have become a place that there's a place where they come and they get judgment. There's a place where they come and they get interrupted. It's a place where they come and they get lectured. We're no longer just a safe place to come and to get the relief of the burdens that they're carrying. And when we know that we just love our babies so much, we love our children and we want them to know that and we do this out of love when what's really happening is we're communicating the opposite message. So I have this image here and we're connected on Facebook. You may have seen this one. It says your children will follow your example, not your advice. Oh, we'll just let that one rest right there. Number five, I'm reading what Jeanette says, listen and be what they need, later advice, yes. Number five, ask sincere questions. Sincere is the key word here. Why did you do that? It's not really a question where you're really showing that you care and value what it is they have to say. It's saying, I can't make sense of this situation that you're sharing. So now I'm asking questions to get my own clarity and I'm way beyond your story right now because I'm trying to make my, the story work in my head. So asking sincere questions, I'm imagining that's going to create an environment where you are showing to them that you really want to know more about what it is they have to say. So how did that make you feel? What were you thinking as that was happening? And not what were you thinking? You hear the difference in the tone. But tell me, what were the thoughts that were going through your mind when that was happening? Now that you've had some time since that happened, and you look back on it, what are you thinking? How did that feel? Hmm. So all of those are questions that communicate. I want to know more about how this situation, this story affects you. What are your thoughts on it? Where is your heart in the matter right now? How can I get a better glimpse of just how important or how hurtful or how disappointing this was for you? How can I take off my cloak and embrace you and enter into your world in this moment by asking key questions. I'm gonna check my notes to make sure I'm not missing something because I might have a couple of questions here that would help you all. Yeah, nope, we're still on task, we're doing great. So asking sincere questions. Let's move to number six. Be aware of your nonverbal communication. Mm. So how many of us, okay, we're back to me again. I won't point you ladies out. 
when I start thinking about something deeply, I get this look right here. You see that like this brow, this whole thing becomes all constricted and I might be reading something or thinking about something or trying to figure something out. And my whole face looks like this. So the more <laughs> one of my children could be trying to tell me a story, the more intense into the story I get, the more I'm like looking deeper into them. <laughs> and yes, I have very expressive eyes. So my eyes, I'm thinking I'm being intense and focused on what they have to say, but my face might communicate to them that I think it's wrong or out of line or I don't agree. And there's none of that. For me, I'm like, no, I'm just focused. But uh, being aware of my body, I might have my arms crossed. And for them, that creates a feeling of I'm not open to what they have to say. When really, I'm trying to keep my hands from moving because I want to jump in. So I'm trying to hold myself back, like just be quiet, just listen. And for them, they're thinking, what, what, what's going on? Like, why are you, why are your arms all crossed? Why is your face all messed up? <laughs> It's like, what's going on? And I'm like, well, wait, wait, for me, I'm listening. I'm with you, but I have to be aware. Once again, what would be something that could help bring awareness in that moment that we've already talked about that we could do very easily that could help us bring awareness and to get present? Let's see who's going to answer me here. Oh, I see three people typing. Let's see, four people. Yes. Take a deep breath. And I like that too, Susan. That's actually very important. I love that you put in there that we might be on our computers, our tablets, our phones, our, our um, music players, MP3 players, any of those things can also communicate that. And I don't even know that we have, I guess that being present, the eye contact would come in there, but that is truly so, so important. I completely agree. But yes, take a deep breath. If I was to take a deep breath when I'm calling myself being really focused and I just it softens everything. It softens my face. It softens my voice. It takes the tension out of my body because what's probably happened is they've said something and I'm like and I go right into tense face and tense body and pulled in arms trying to hold back and resist. But instead, I just need to take a deep breath and just be with them in that moment. Okay, let's see. Carmel is saying, I have strong nonverbal communication and I've learned to have some of the most important conversations in the dark, both children and hubby. Very interesting. I can still be my overly nonverbal, but it allows me a chance to catch myself before I speak. That is so awesome. In the dark. What an ultimate safe space. Like how many of our children love tight spaces? They love to get up under furniture. Anybody else have children like that? Mine love to get on under furniture, like tables, our desks. They love to be in their closet, up under clothes or underneath racks. They love those places. They love to get underneath beds and make little tents. Like tight, closed-in spaces, they just love. That's where they'll go to read or to play toys or to take a nap sometimes. They just love those places where they feel safe. But just turning off the lights is genius. Man, that's awesome, Carmel. Thank you for that. Oh, Jeanette says suck on a mint. <laughs> yes, I love that. Oh my goodness, yes. Put something in your mouth. Yes, you're just like, hello. Now I know I can't talk so easily because I've got this mint in my mouth. Yeah, yeah. I might need a spoonful of peanut butter. That way my mouth is kind of stuck together and I'm kind of sucking, you know. It's just, yes, but... For us, being aware of our nonverbal communication reminded me of this quote from Maya Angelou. It says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So if we know that speech is one of the poorest forms of communication, and we know that people will forget anywhere from 50 to 75% of what we said, then we know how important it is 
that we have our nonverbal communication, communicating the message that we want them to feel from our heart. We want them to have our full attention. We want to be present. We want to minimize our advice and our interruptions. And we want to ensure that we're communicating a message that even if we don't say anything, they feel our heart. They feel our love. They feel our care. They feel our concern. They feel our compassion. They feel our empathy. What a message that is to communicate. We're going to jump into number seven. Stay interested and engaged. Okay, this one can be really tricky for me because I've got some real storytellers in my household. And sometimes the stories tend to grow with all the things that are happening around them. Suddenly, whatever is in their story, they start talking about as their sister walks by. And then my sister walked into the room in my dream, and she had um, a book. And it's a lot like that book that's in her hand. And on and on and on. And the story keeps growing and growing, and I can feel myself going. And I have learned to start repeating some of their pieces of their story back to them in that moment. And that seems to bring them back focused. And then I start asking questions that lead to a conclusion. And I, okay, and then the end, tell me about what happened at the end. Oh my, and is this story one that has a whole nother part to it? Or is this the end of that part? And I start trying to wind it down because I know that that story will continue to grow and grow and grow. And it's just really, okay, we need to bring this to a close, a close, a close. Because I, I, I can't, <laughs> I cannot stay with you in this, but I have a tip for you. So if you have that challenge, where did my tip go? Did it run away from me? No, here it is. Okay, tip. So if you find <clears throat> it particularly difficult to concentrate on what someone is saying, Try repeating their words mentally as they say them. So now this might work better with your husband if he's having a particular day where he's verbose and he's sharing a story. You might mentally try repeating some of the things he said to reinforce the message so that when you do enter into conversation with him, you're right on track and your mind hasn't wandered off to something. So for me, this looks like when my husband gets on a roll and he wants to start talking about financial reports. Uh, maybe he wants to jump into what's happening in the stock market or what's happening with different real estate and percentages and return on investment rates and all of these cap rates that he wants to talk about. And honey, my brain goes snooze. Okay. It's like, I don't find this interesting. I don't, this, what, can we relate to people? or how this makes people feel, or how it affects jobs, or children, or, or something, some kind of world issue, something, get me back in here, because if you just stay on these numbers, and heaven forbid you whip out an Excel spreadsheet, I might just fall off my chair, like I just can't, it's just not my world at all, <laughs> it's just, so I will find myself repeating some of those things mentally um, with him, to go, okay, he was interested in this particular piece of real estate and it had this ROI. So that when I do open my mouth to connect with him, because I'm not saying become a wall, right? Where they're just talking and your head is just, no, I don't want that, that's not communication, but it is giving someone the floor and giving them a moment to have their say, right? But you don't want to lose your mind because you're zoning out and going off you know, looking over their head and then noticing how you want to change those kitchen cabinets or how you really should update those family pictures or whatever else might come to mind. So mentally repeating some of the things so that you can hang your hat on some of the information that was just shared by your child or your husband or whomever. And then you can jump back into the conversation and still be with, right? Okay, I'm going to see what I'm missing here. Because you ladies are jumping in. I love it. <laughs> oh, I agree, Jerry. There is a lot of giving and listening. And what is it that we're truly given when we're listening? Seriously. What is it that we're really giving when we're listening? 
love. I completely agree. I completely agree. What is it that makes our prayers safe with the Father? Is we know he hears us. We know that he hears us with ears of compassion, of love, of gentleness, of acceptance. And that's the same gift that we give to others when we listen to them. But it's the same gifts that we withhold when we're not good listeners. And that's the part that's an out to the gut. That we're not showing compassion to people. That we're not showing love or acceptance, empathy or compassion. The better listener we are, the more we get to communicate the message of love. Number eight, match your facial expression to the conversation. So once again, I wouldn't want to be practices, practicing being a better listener. So I think that means that I have a smile on my face. And you're sharing a story about how you felt betrayed by a friend. And I'm just sitting there with a smile like, I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. Because it doesn't match the conversation, right? Likewise, I wouldn't want to call being a good listener having a stoic face with my eyes fully on you, and you're telling me a joke. It doesn't match. They're trying to share laughter and build connection through laughter and joy, and instead, my face communicates, it's not very funny. That wasn't funny at all. <laughs> it doesn't match. So you want to match your facial expression to the conversation at hand. And the great thing about good conversation is it changes. So the conversation can go from light and then it can go really deep and then it can go light again and it can go really deep. And you want to have your face match the way the conversation is going. And that's going to require you to be a better and better listener to catch when that conversation is making those shifts. Because you could still be the smiling and then go, oh, oh, oh. No, they were serious. They meant that one. And you have to, oh, I better shift it. I better change the emotion here. I better match what's happening right before my eyes. Because we just took a turn around a corner. We got serious real quick. Anybody had a situation like that? Where you're thinking this is lighthearted and you realize, oh, my. Oh, my. Now, that was a serious heart moment right there. They just shared something that was a real fear. They weren't jokingly afraid of that. That was a real fear. Or that was a real concern. Or that was a real hurt. Or that was a real disappointment. So we want to be very aware. Oh, thank you, Susan. I'm not out there alone where I'm laughing. And then I go, oh, my goodness, that was serious. Yes, we want to have our facial expression match the conversation. Are you ladies finding these helpful? I really enjoyed this workshop. I thought it was so good. And we're getting down to the last two tips. And I, um, I'm hoping that you ladies are finding these to be just great tips for you as you're working with your kids. Wonderful. Great, Tracy. I'm glad to hear that. OK, number nine, repeat what they say to ensure that you heard it correctly. So this is such a huge thing with my children especially, but I should say with anybody, because when someone repeats what you said, especially when their heart is to ensure they heard you correctly, you know they're with you. Because see, we can fake that we're listening with the uh-huh, mm-hmm, yep, you bet. Yeah, mm-hmm, I get it, that's true. Right? We can just be nodding and a mm hmm and a yep, yep. And we don't have a clue what they said, especially if you're dealing with a little kid who's just learning to talk and they've got like this language of their own. And you just, mm hmm, yeah. And you're looking at family members like, what are they saying? And nobody seems to know what's happening. And you're just nodding. We have not the clue, right? Yeah, they have not a clue. Yes, we understand that that can be a saying, that can be a season. But the truth is, we want to ensure, we want to ensure the person who's speaking to us that we're with you. And it just looks like repeating what they said. So you said that she came in the room and 
Um, she didn't acknowledge you at all. And then they can go, yeah, can you believe that? You know, we've been best of friends. And she came in the room and she didn't even acknowledge that I was there. And I was so hurt. You just communicated, I hear you in that. You didn't attach any judgment, any advice, any other communication with the no comments to it. You just repeated what they said and allowed them to go deeper. And ah, I get so excited. And when you say that to them, it helps the person who said it to process it even de deeper and they get in touch with their emotion behind it. Because sometimes when we're telling something for the first time, we're really sharing the facts. We're sharing a little bit of emotion, but it's mostly about facts just to bring the listener up to speed about what happened. But when the listener takes that extra moment to say, well, so you're telling me that um, you went out to your car and there was a big ding in the door and they get to say, yes, and I'm still whatever. I just got that car. I've waited so long. And now my car is ready. You follow me? They get to now say, someone just said back to me my facts. And that gives me the permission to release the need to get the facts straight so that we're caught up together to have a conversation. And now I can just get in touch with how I feel about those facts. Is that making sense? So allow them the space by just simply repeating what they said, repeating it back to them, and watch the doors open. Watch how everything starts to have a different flow and a different tone and take on a depth that we don't reach if we make the mistake of the earlier one that I don't have in front of me where we jump in with our comments and advice. So we take the facts, we jump in with comments and advice, and we cut off the opportunity for them to really tell us how they felt about that. For the, us to hear the truth of how they're processing that. Because that's what matters. Is how are they thinking about the facts? Because the facts just are. But we can attach meaning to those facts by how we think. And we want to hear how our children are thinking. We want to hear how our husbands are thinking. We want to hear how our friends are thinking. Because as a man, think it. Come on, somebody. I know somebody wants to fill that one in. Because as a man thinketh, right? So is he. That's exactly right, Jerry. That is exactly right. But if we cut off, well, I can feel my eyes watering up. If we cut off the opportunity for our children to share, we don't get in touch with what they're really thinking. And we miss the most golden of opportunities and the greatest of gifts to hear their hearts. And how many children are running around right now feeling as if they've never really been heard? I don't know that they wouldn't say they haven't been loved because they know we love them. But they haven't been heard. And that for them feels like they haven't been loved. Oh. Number 10, be yourself. Our children can tell when we don't mean it. We think we're hiding it, but they can tell. So if you're not a rah-rah, Go family, kind of mom. Please don't fake that you are. Now you can be kind and you don't have to be rah-rah, right? They're not the same thing. Being rah-rah is not the same thing as being kind or being gentle or being patient or being attentive or smiling and making your face pleasant. It doesn't have to be rah-rah, overly cheesy grinned. You know, you're so grinning so hard that the kids, you're actually scaring the children, right? But you got to be yourself. Because they know you. And they love you. 
what they're asking for you to do is to love them and accept them. So you don't have to be what you think is the definition of a good mom. And a good mom would be very encouraging and syrupy sweet all the time. Yeah, if I went out there and did that, my kids would be like, what is wrong with you? Like, what is that? That's not you. I could try it, but they'd go, that, that is not you. But they can also sense when we disagree with what they're saying. And we try to say, no, I'm, no, I'm okay. I'm okay that you believe that. I'm okay that you believe that. They can tell. You can still say, you know, I don't agree with the conclusion you've come to. I don't agree with the choices that you made. But I want you to know this. I love you anyway. I'm okay with letting you know that I don't share the same opinion. I do not change my opinion of you. So you hear the difference? I'm not asking you to completely agree with your children. I'm not asking you to become mute on issues where you clearly see that there's a right and a wrong. But there's a difference between the action, the decision, the situation, the circumstances being wrong and making your children wrong. You can separate the two so that you don't ever communicate to them that they're wrong and they're bad. They can make bad choices. Don't we know that to be true? Because I know I've made a fair share of my own. But there's such a distinction between the choices that they make, the opinions that they're forming, the friendships that they're aligning with, and my opinion of them and who they are. My opinion is on the, the facts, the stuff, right? My acceptance is of them as a person. So being sincere, let me, let me pick up on what's happening in this chat box. Yes, they can pick up on the hypocrisy so easily, Susan, I completely agree. Susan, up ahead, you said uh, those children can get so easily lost in the mix and the squeaky wheels often demand our attention. Squeaky wheels. I actually wrote an article, which I'm not even sure I ever posted online, and I really want to get better about some of the things that I've written. Actually, getting them out so they can be of help. Hello. Um, but one of the things I wrote on is about having a black sheep in the family. So many families have that black sheep, that child. That I love that you describe it as the squeaky wheel. In my opinion, that child is usually the one who is the most sensitive in the entire family. And they're so sensitive to the hypocrisy. They're so sensitive to the anger. They're so sensitive to the conflict, the drama, the issues in the home, that the only way they know to deal with and process those is through unhealthy choices, either in friends or in drugs or in alcohol or in music or in sex or some other difficult, harmful, hurtful behavior. They don't know what to do with that. You know, other children in the family can ignore it or avoid it or wall themselves off from it. But if you've got a sensitive child, they don't know what to do with that. And so they act out on it in the most unhealthy ways. And what happens as a society, gracious, I am so emotional from this training. Mm. What happens as a society is we see the acting out and we shame them even more. Oh my gosh, look at that child over there with the drug problem and look at that child the way they're dressing or look at that child the way they're behaving and we shame it and we shame it. The very people who are just trying to deal with their junk. What if instead we just looked at them as a fellow person on this journey of life who's doing the best they can, just like us. We just may have makeup on ours and maybe clean clothes and we have a smile pasted on our stuff because we can hide it that way. We can put our, our uh, public face on and go out and they just don't know how to do that. And so they're doing the best that they possibly can. And yeah, squeaky wheel. Yes, I get that. You're so welcome. 
Yes, nothing you can do can ever make me love you any more or any less. I love that. Families, homeschool families place too much confidence in the time we are with them. Our presence does not guarantee relationship or closeness. And may that be a check-in for all of us, homeschooling or not. That just because we pick our kids up from school and, and we take them home or we're homeschooling them and we're with them all day or we attend every football game, every soccer game, every performance, every ballet recital, because we are present, that that means that we're somehow connected and close. They're not the same thing. In fact, the more busy we are, the more opportunities we have created in our schedule to be disconnected. That is not for us to become proud of an empty calendar because that does not ensure connection either. That's why I talk about being an intentional parent, being very on purpose about building connection and relationship with our children. And just as a quick reminder, <sighs> it's in your heart not the dictionary that gives meaning to your words from Matthew 12, 34 in the message version. Once again, our hearts are what gives meaning not only to our words, but to our communication period. So may our listening communicate a message from our hearts of love, of acceptance, of compassion for our children, for our husbands, for our friends, for anyone that we are in conversation with. May they know that they know that when they look into our eyes, they are loved. Ladies, that's all I wanted to share. If you have any questions or comments, I am open for that right now. Mm. Hey, Veronica, I didn't know you were in here. Hey, girl, you are so welcome. <laughs> you guys can, as you're typing, also give me feedback on how did you like it with video versus picture? Did that make a difference? Did it mess up anybody's internet connection while we were here? You are so welcome, Tracy. Truly my honor. Oh, very nice. Yay, okay, so you do like the video. Love the video, perfect. Need to be a good listener to when they are younger, so when they are teens, yes. Oh, I already have some relationship. They're not so reliant on friends, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, you ladies truly are a gift to me to have this time each month to be able to share. Because truly, I'm taking in so much information. I need somewhere to like pour it out. And you ladies provide that for me. So thank you. <laughs> the two year old pout. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, I, yeah, I get the emotional, Susan, I tell you, and it's good, it's so good. Well, ladies, I have the date, let's see, I hope I have it right, I try to double check my calendar, it's the fourth Tuesday, and if I have that right, I'll be right back here on May the 26th for another lesson. I don't know what that one will be, but I think that what, well, I've had some friends advise me, so I'm going to follow their advice. I don't know exactly what the topic will be, but it'll be stuff that I'm writing in my book that's supposed to be coming out this summer, um, The Intentional Parent. It will be coming out this summer, not supposed to. It will be coming out this summer. And um, so I'm going to pull some things from that, some um, key pieces that have been on my heart that I'd love to share. I just don't know exactly what those are. So just title it The Intentional Parent or Intentional Parenting will be our topic next time. And we'll jump into that. Um, I will share from there. Um, hopefully, it will give you guys a taste and flavor for what the book is really all about and, and what's been on my mind. And 
I don't know that I have anything else. Once again, I'll put my contact info up there. There's my website. Um, that's where the replays for all past Moms Night Out are up there. I mean, what do we have now? Good six, seven hours of past uh, Moms Night Outs that are available. Feel free to go watch those. Feel free to share those with friends and invite them to take part. Um, on that website, that's where you can subscribe to make sure that you get notifications about upcoming dates. I let the email list know first, then I post it on Facebook and invite people to join in. But the email list is the main way for us to stay in contact. Um, and if you need to email me, feel free to email me, Susan, at SusanC.com. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. If anybody wants some one-on-one -on -one time with me, I can let you know how we can get that done. But most of all, I just want you all to know that your time with your kids is short. Be intentional about it. And I'm going to check the chat box to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, well, yeah, if, if you have some ideas on how to get more ladies here, please let me know. Uh, when they look into your eyes, they know that you love them. Oh, that's awesome, Veronica. Yes, if you guys have ideas on how to get more ladies here, I'd be happy to have them. Uh, I'm happy to have you guys. I'm happy to have more ladies. Um, whomever is sent this way, may I serve them well. That is my desire. And uh, if there's nothing else, I don't see anything happening. Oh, wait, Jerry's typing. Yeah, they really are, Susan. The years truly are flying by. Oh, yeah, Jerry, were you going to say something? Or Jeanette, I see you typing. Yeah, truly. All right, ladies, well, you know how to reach out to me. In the meantime, have a fantastic month, and I will see you on May, if I don't see you first, on Facebook or via email. Have a great night. Bye-bye.